It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 41, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. My guest today is Andrea Hazard. Andrea grows and mills 30 acres of ancient and heirloom grains from black beans and red corn to emmer, spelt, einkorn, and oats. Returning to her family farm in Pecatonica, Illinois to grow vegetables, she gravitated back to grains with a twist on what her family and her neighbors are doing. We get into the nitty gritty of growing and handling specialty grains and the differences between planning and marketing a shelf stable product and planning and marketing vegetables. Along the way, we get into the challenges of working with a distributor the joys of working with family, and the special demands of farming as a woman. I hope you enjoy this show just as much as I enjoyed making it for you. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Vermont Compost. Founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality composts and compost-based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Farmigo CSA Management Software, providing the tools you need to manage your CSA business. Farmigo CSA Management Software has a customizable management system to meet your farm's specific needs. CSA Management Software.com. Andrea Hazard, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad that you could make time on a on a rainy Monday night here in the Upper Midwest to make this happen. It's perfect timing. So, Andy, I've already talked a little bit about your farm. Can you, in your own words, tell us about how Hazard Free Farm came to be and how you ended up being a grain grower? Because that's not where you started. Although, well, I guess it is where you started as a kid, but then it's not where you started as a as a young adult. Yeah. Well, you know, it's kind of come full circle. I always had the desire to be involved in the family farm, but, you know, as things are with land prices and things like that, there just wasn't really room. And I always had more of a leaning toward organic and chemical free. And so as I uh, decided to get into it, I decided to go with a vegetable operation and um, I really enjoyed growing vegetables, but in the back of my mind, I still was sort of longing for those those fields of grain that I knew as a child from the family farm. And so, you know, everything with farming is about timing. And I pitched the idea to my father early on. He kind of flatly said, no, you, you're really good at vegetable farming. Why don't you stick with that? But um, I think in the back of his mind, he was thinking, when I would step down and Adam takes over, I'll have time to kind of experiment and do this with Andrea. And that is indeed what happened. And so in 2012, we started experimenting and officialized the grain business in 2013 and then started transitioning back out of vegetables. And now you're not doing any vegetables at all. You've completely switched over to doing the grains. Yeah, well, you know, vegetable farmers are, I really have a sweet spot in my heart for veggies. And I still have a couple greenhouses. I grow seed garlic. And um, we still have kale in the greenhouse and peppers right now. So we're out of it, but we still have a, I got a pinky in it, I guess. It's a hard habit to kick. It is. It's a horrible habit to kick. Good food, all that. (laughs) Yeah. Tell me about your grain farm, because most of my listeners and and me, I'm, I mean, I feel pretty comfortable when we talk about vegetables. I know what, what veggie farms look like. I know what kinds of acreages make sense on that. How big of a grain farm do you have? Well, you know, we started with about 10 acres. It's just experimental, you know, we needed to figure out, is there a marketplace? How are we going to market? How are we going to process? Because it's food grade, so it is a little bit different. Um, And it's just grown from there. So we're currently operating at 30 acres, which isn't very big, but um, we're still building our marketplace. And because our focus is on ancient grains, ancient grains are a hauled grain, the processing for them has been a little tricky. And then um, what we've been doing is taking on uh, other farmers and marketing their products. And so uh, this last year we had our first farmer start. We provided the seed and then they do the growing and then we do the processing and marketing. 
Okay. So that's a way to kind of expand your scale without having to do it all there with your production. Right. Absolutely. And to give people a foot in the door if they want to switch and diversify and just kind of stick their toe in the water, it gives them an opportunity to do that, which is really nice. So 30 acres is a would be a fairly large vegetable operation in this part of the country, but it's a compared to your neighbors and probably even compared to your family farm, you're I mean it's 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 hardly even a puddle's worth. Yeah, um, it's like a postage stamp when it comes to grain farming. Um you know, it, it we're just kind of I do a couple acres of a lot of different things. We currently grow about twelve crops. So as you can imagine, it's an acre of this or two acres of that. And as far as the corn production goes, we're doing heirloom corn, and it's hard to find a uh, seed that's been improved. So what right. the last five years has been is, is me uh, improving the varieties by selection. So really just getting out there in the field and selecting for the right plants and the right the right ear confirmations and things like that. Exactly. And we've taken some of the varieties from having ear placement at like, you know, six feet, seven feet. Well, as you can imagine, those three down in the field. Um, and we've pushed that ear placement down on that um, stock down to like, you know, three feet, four feet, what we're used to seeing in, in fields. And then we it's about disease resistance, you know, with everything. So just choosing those years that are hardy. I think it's such an important concept when, uh, when you're saving seeds, whether you're doing vegetables or whether you're doing grains is, is that selection happens, whether you, whether you like it or not, and you're either going to manage that process or, or it's going to, it's going to go in directions that you don't necessarily want it to go. Right. Very true. I can imagine how you would do corn production on a small scale, right? You probably are out there with a two or a four row corn planter and and conventional equipment for cultivating. How does it work when you're doing something like the emmers or the, the ancient wheats that you're growing? Well, it's been interesting. I mean, we've had a couple of years where we used really small scale equipment, but because of the size of my um, of the family operation, there uh, there's access to you know a twelve row vacuum planter. So that's actually what we use to plant our corn this year. It's pretty high tech and pretty funny because, you know, it, it doesn't take us very long to plant and then we need to change seeds and vacuum everything out. Um, but with the small grains, it's really quite easy because we're using, I wouldn't say easy, but the equipment is easy to come by because we're just using a grain drill. And then the tricky part is figuring out what depth to feed everything and what rate because the hauled grains most people have never had to deal with them. They're used to doing wheat or oats, and those um, are are easier to handle. And people generally have a lot more experience with wheat and oats rather than, you know, emmer and stout and einkorn and those types of things. You've mentioned the the hold grain aspect a couple of times. Um, and now I think of when I think of oats, those kind of have a hole around them, right? Yeah, they do. And so it's that kind of thing, but on on these on these ancient wheats, that's you you've got a hole on those as well. Yes, yes. I would think that the time and energy that you'd have to put into even just simple things like calibrating the grain drill would be pretty complicated for for all those different crops. Yeah, it is the first the first time you calibrate a grain drill, it's a little bit tricky, but after that you get used to it. And basically, what you do is fill it up. Uh, you know how many plants you want to see per foot. If you're saving your own seed, you need to do some germ testing, see what your rate is and increase your pounds per acre according to what your germination is. And then just like what time of the season is it? You kind of got to listen to your intuition on those seeding rates. And then you just run that drill on the ground and then count the seeds per foot. And that'll give you a real good idea. I mean, it's similar with vegetable farming. As you know, if you're if you're seeding something, you want to watch how many seeds are falling, and you know, do you need to change the plate or you know make adjustments to make sure it's right? 
Okay. So with vegetable seeds though, I can, I can open up Elliot Coleman's new organic grower uh, or the Johnny's catalog and get information about, about spacings or number of seeds per foot. That stuff's pretty widely available. Where are you coming up with that for ancient grains? Well, you just, they recommend around a hundred pounds an acre and some people, you know, depending on the situation will go up or down from there. And so a lot of what we've done is you know, plant a couple rounds at 100 pounds, plant a couple rounds at 120, and just kind of experiment and see. And keep notes, keep notes, keep notes, keep notes. And and you start to get a good picture after a bit. It'll be nice if we ever move to larger acreages because then as we run through with the combine, we'll have a better idea of what those BPAs are based you know, for tracking what our planting rate was and, and be able to see we're so small right now, it's kind of hard to see that. When you say BPAs, that's, that's what the bushels per acre acre. that's showing up on your, on your yield monitor in the combine. Yeah. Okay. And it sounds like you're using just conventional harvesting equipment. Then you, you get out there with your family's big combine and run that through your one acre of grain. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, the joke is, you know, dad won't let anyone drive the combine but him. So he, he kind of handles that part. But I'm out in the field um, walking behind and we're stopping because there are a lot of situations. I think, you know, the planting actually is a little easier. The harvesting of these grains is trickier when they're hauled because they're lighter. And you really have to know how to adjust your combine and make sure like the straw walkers are working properly and the seeds are falling through. And we had a situation this um, summer with our purple barley that we lost so much seed in the field that it looked like we planted a cover crop. Yeah, and I I guess when you're dealing with something as valuable as food grade grains, that's not such a good thing. Right, right. But you know, there's, you know, with farming, the the game with farming to me is that it's gonna be, something screwy is always constantly happening. And it's it's about keeping your cool and your creativity and, and being able to laugh and go, well, you we learned one there when you screw things up because there's just so many variables in farming. Yeah, and, and of course now you're just throwing more variables at it by throwing <laughs> I, uh, by growing a bunch of different kinds of grain. Yeah, I still think vegetable farming is trickier because there's so many different crops with vegetables. At least with grains, you kind of have three categories. You have your corn, you have your small grains, and your beans. And, you know, you could break your small grains down into hauled and unhauled, but that's still really only four plant sectors which is when you're doing veggies, you know, you've got so many more crop families to learn about. Right. Right. So are you growing all three of those then corn, small grains and beans? Mm -hmm. Yes, we are. And then this year we did, um, we're only doing one type of beans right now. We're just doing black beans, but um, we are up to five kinds of corn. And, and where are you marketing all of these wacky things? I mean, yeah. this is—I mean, clearly you're not taking this to downtown Pecatonica, Illinois, and selling them at the farmers market. No, or are you? I have been thinking though that maybe I should approach the local grocer with rolled oats because that's a crop that everyone is very familiar with, and people eat a lot of oats, and so that might be a nice fit. Our grocer here in Pecatonica actually is very. Uh, supportive of small farms and they carry local eggs and they carry popcorn and all sorts of different things locally. So they definitely support the local food movement. But currently, the majority of our crops, because of my connections in the Chicagoland area from when I was vegetable farming, um, I just, as I got into the grains, I started marketing both veggies and grains to my restaurants and just transitioned them along with me. And it was nice because I knew uh, I had those good relationships and I could, you know, 
prepare them for what was coming and get their feedback and see what they wanted and what they were chasing after because they're always changing uh, what they want and, and all that. Was that something that was a was supply driven by you saying, I'm going to get into grains or was this something that people were asking for before you started growing them? People wanted it and there were a handful um, of people doing small grains, but it was pretty limited to beans and wheat. And so there wasn't a lot of other options in corn, you know, some kinds of corn. So I'm, it's not like I created the wheel there, but there was just a growing demand. And with people eating more and more local food, I think a lot of people, it hadn't even occurred to them, oh, right, of course, corn and barley and all these crops. And so it just sort of naturally came together in that sense. And that's something that's that's interesting to me about getting into grains in this area is is how much so many of the grains are adapted to specific climates. Like okay, and I and I may be I may be completely off my rocker here, but my understanding is like if you want to grow a good bread wheat, you do that out in North Dakota where it's dry in the summer. So, you know, that's where you're going to grow your hard red winter wheats out there. And that if you, you know, if you want to grow like a soft white pastry wheat, you're going to do that in a different climate. I can't remember where you're supposed to do that. And, and I know from talking to people who've tried dried beans in the, in the upper Midwest, that there's a reason that we don't do dried beans in the upper Midwest anymore. You are absolutely right. Um, Canada in particular and the West in America are, that is the breadbasket, and that's where we do most of the growing of these crops. Um, it is tricky to grow them in the Midwest. Generally, the small grains prefer thinner soil and less moisture, particularly during head formation. However, When you start looking at the big picture with the changes in our climate and the restricted availability of water in the West, the warming up of the uh, Canadian border, they're planting corn in Canada now where they never did before. Things are changing, and I think it's important to adapt and find varieties of small grains that can be grown in the Midwest. It does add to the health of our soil to not always be on a one crop rotation of corn, 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 or even two, corn, soy, corn, soy. And a lot of farmers are doing more winter wheat around here. We do have issues in Illinois. We, you know, have been blessed with really rich soil here, and it's not always perfect for those small grains. But I think it's important to at least have some experience with them and Also, there are a lot of, there is a lot of land in Illinois and in Wisconsin that is marginal, that isn't very good for corn because it's a little thin. And those are those areas where we can grow small grains or at least experiment with them. Tell me about how you're doing things like weed control in in a small grain crop. My understanding is that if you want to do small grains for human consumption in um, you know in a, on a large scale with with something that's that's really familiar, a lot of what what happens in making that human consumable is is cleaning the weed seeds out if you're doing it in an organic setting. Right. Um, how are you managing that? Well, you know, field prep is everything. So preparing those beds the year before, doing a little bit of, um, you know, letting those weeds flush up, knocking them down, planting early, planting good seed, hardy seed. And then um, I have been known to go through a grain crop with a rotary hoe. And that, that can help if, you know, if you're having a little trouble. Just, you know, the, the key is to not look back when you do it. Just go and, just, and don't think about what you're doing. But um, generally with the small grains, we've had pretty good luck. We do all of our own cleaning here on farm. So we know when we go in to harvest a crop, if it's going to be weedy, we get that right into the cleaner and get those weed seeds out and get that grain into a dryer. Um, and get it ready for a longer term storage and then further processing. So you're doing all of your processing right there on the farm. Yeah. And that definitely adds a whole nother um, ball of wax to the operation. It's been a real 
challenge um, to find small scale affordable equipment and we have had to be very creative and resourceful in putting to putting it together. Um, the grinding part, because we do grind our grain and we make flour and cornmeal and polenta, that part is pretty easy. It's been the, the dehulling and getting a, a grain cleaner that fits the size of our operation and then just handling all these different grains, um, cleaning out augers, things like that, because we want to have as little contamination as possible. From one variety to the next. Yeah, you know, it's not a good thing when you have purple barley popping up in your oats. You know, it just we try to keep everything separate. And the biggest thing is with the um, with the wheat. So many people are gluten free, and we are not a gluten free operation. And but we do kind of go to lengths to clean out equipment and be real careful and thoughtful about it. Yeah, that would be a I think a really interesting part of dealing with these these potentially. I guess you'd call them allergen crops, Absolutely. like the like the gluten. You know, you don't you don't run into that much with vegetables. No, no, and it's interesting because you know we use large scale equipment, and I mean, unless you have a combine, and that combine is the only combine you use to do wheat, and you only do wheat with it. Um, I don't know how there isn't contamination because the combines now are so big and complicated, we really have trouble cleaning them out. And so we actually are, are in the market for an older combine. We want to go backward in time and find something that we can clean out better. Really, that's kind of an interesting conundrum. So walk us through a crop of, say, something like emmer. How might that crop go from beginning to end? Well, the first thing is, um, you know, hopefully you've acquired seed from uh, a good source and your seed is healthy. Now, you can't actually see the seed because when you plant those hulled grains, you do not need hull them. You plant them with the hull on. So um, the first thing would be if it's been unsized, run it through a clipper, um, you know, choose some screen sizes that'll take off the small ones so that you're putting a, a larger seed size into the ground and that they're uh, pretty much, you know, the same. And uh, from there, you're going to go, you know, make sure all your field prep is done. So you're going to be out there. You might run a rototiller over it if you have that or um, cultivator in a drag. Or if you're doing no-till, you know, maybe you're planting right into corn stubble. So you might just have run over that corn stubble a little bit to break it up and then run your uh, grain drill over that. And then just calibrating your grain drills. So you're going to load your drill. Good to be on a spot, you know, where you can see the grain falling out. You're going to just drop it and run it for maybe three or four feet. And then, you know, adjust everything. Make sure that you're getting that those seeds, you know, enough per foot. And then once you get into the field, you're going to do the same thing again and check your depth to make sure that everything is um, making good seed to soil contact. With that grain drill then, are you just using like a, a normal old Van Brunt grain drill? Yep. Old, you know, John Deere with the green paint and the chains dragging behind it? Yep, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. We, we have used some fancier models. We borrowed one from the neighbor one year that was a no-till um, and used his. And that worked pretty nice, but we ended up back at the old, the old uh, John Deere drill, and it worked great, really. Okay. So now you've got the seeds planted in the soil. What's next? Depending on what the weather is doing, you might be able to get in there and, and run a rotary hole it, over it. It's if, the, if your seeds haven't emerged, but your weeds have, it's a good idea to go out there and, and rotary hoe and then let your grain come up and just, you know, it just really is so weather dependent. Just like with vegetables, um, those blind tillage opportunities are really kind of important. And so just keeping an eye on that. And once, once your grain is up and like over three inches, your work is done. You've done everything you can to to remove any weeds that need to be weeded and it's off and running on its own at that point. And if you're a conventional farmer, you might go in with a broadleaf herbicide to knock down 
anything that's out there, whether it be velvet leaf or mirror sale or whatever might pop up. Um, but we don't we don't have that uh, that opportunity because we don't take that road. But um, so for us, that early season uh, field prep and that blind cultivation using that rotary hoe are all really big things that need to be tended to in a timely basis. And I guess I should ask at the beginning, this is all happening in the spring or is this something that you've done in the fall? Spring, yeah. Our The majority of our operation is spring planted grains. I would like to diversify into more fall planted grains, but we just never, just haven't gotten there. I kind of feel like we kind of have enough on our plate right now. So. <laughs> okay, we, we can, you know, we can give you a pass on that right, one, Andy. Right, right. Okay, so the grain the grain grows up. You've done this in probably April or May. Yep. Right. Yep. Okay. And and when are you going to be coming in to start harvest? So typically your crops will begin to head out in um, July, and those heads will pop out of, out of the the stems, and then it'll look for a long time like they're ready to be harvested. Um, but what's happening is that those grains inside uh, the, the bract, they're all forming. So then you wait until things get real nice and plump. So you're out there checking the grain in, in mid-August and early August to see as soon as the grain is, is as big as it's going to be, it's all plumped up and now it's starting to dry down. Um, the biggest thing at that time is, you know, we get summer storms then, so you can have lodging which is where the plants fall down in the field, or you can have, um, if they get too dry, they'll shatter as the combine comes through and fall on the ground before they ever make it into the combine, and that can be problematic as well. So again, with the timing, um, and yeah, at the end of the field, you go with your combine, and then the next step is, getting it all unloaded and cleaned in the seed cleaner and then dried if it needs to be dried and then stored. And then are you, are you windrowing these before you pick them up with the combine? Like I remember when and I've never harvested oats myself, but when we had a neighbor harvest oats or, or rye for us, they, they would come through and uh, I think they called it swatting. They would swat the grain. Yeah. And- swatting. Mm-hmm. They do that. Some with, um, I've heard that they do that if you're growing buckwheat. Um, and they, well, we have an interesting situation this year. Normally we don't do that, but um, we had a fire last year, so we didn't have a combine this year uh, to do my, we didn't have the grain head for the combine that we did have broke. And so we ended up. It, took, it was kind of one of those things where it takes the community to harvest your crop. So we were blessed enough that a couple um, uh, cousin of the family and a neighbor stepped up to help. And we had uh, our iron corn got really weedy. And none of the combines would go through it. So we did end up making a call. We cut it like hay and let it dry in the field. And then we went back in and ran it through the combine. And honestly, it actually worked pretty well. And we got lucky that it didn't really get rained on or anything like that. So it it did work. It was scary. You know, as a farmer, you see your crop out there laying on the ground and you're scratching your head going, gee, you know, it's got to get better than this. Um, but, yeah, it did work. So, But typically, we don't cut anything. You know, we just go ahead and straight combine it. Okay. And, and then the cleaning process, that's not cleaning, like cleaning carrots, that's cleaning, like separating the wheat from the chaff kind of a thing. Exactly. Exactly. And the cleaners all do different things. You know, there is, um, we have a new grain cleaner, uh, that we just got and it's, you know, can handle like eight times what the old one can. So now we're upgrading other augers and things to meet the demand of it and uh, the cleaning process is the first time you run something you're going to take out any big stick pieces of straw whole grain heads that might still be in there and then you usually are taking out any really small fine bits and light and then you'll come back and clean it again so some of our grains 
depending on what it is, um, might get cleaned four times. Oh, but, really? Yeah, before they're ready for sale. And we actually just are adding a new piece of equipment. We finally um, got a gravity table, and that is kind of the the gem at the at, in the crown of the of the equipment that I've been chasing after for a while, and I'm really excited to have it. Um, additionally. Before you before you go on, how does that gravity table work? So gravity table uh, cleans things based on their density, and so it sits at just like a slight angle, a couple degree difference from top to bottom. It blows air from up underneath, and then it also shakes, and it shakes all your light stuff to the bottom, and all your heavy stuff stays at the top, and then you can adjust how many the size of the stream that's coming off so you can get, you know, as many streams off the table as you want, I guess. But typically you run three. You run your bottom white and then your mid- middle ground and then your heavies. And heavies you might save for seed because that's going to be your best fungus kernel. So that's kind of a, been a piece of equipment that I've been really wanting. And when you're talking about augers for, for all of this equipment, that's how you're actually moving the grain from one place to another. You're not you're not sitting there lugging sacks of well, grain and dumping <laughs> it onto the gravity table. We're in the we're in that teenage era of this business where we are getting grown up and we're getting more augers and they're getting bigger and the equipment's getting bigger. But um, actually, tomorrow I'll be in the mill cleaning oats on the old clipper where it's all hand scooped with a bucket. Back to being hardcore. Yeah, yeah. No, well, you know, it keeps you in shape, so. So it goes through the cleaning process, um, then into the dryer? Yeah. Yep. We have a small dryer that we built. Um, we aren't big enough for a batch dryer yet because batch dryers typically require, you know, like maybe 100 bushel or 250 bushel or more common 300 bushel. And we don't have that much of any one thing. And so we kind of just custom built a little dryer that works real. It's pretty nifty and it's been working. I mean, we, it's not, it's not the final answer, but it's, it's what works right now. You know, when you're working on such a small scale and with such diversity, you have to be creative about solving the problems so that our little dryer has worked out real nice. So can you describe that dryer to us? Sure. It's just a, it's an old barge box and then we put a dryer floor in it and then just run a um, propane heater and, and push hot air through it. Up through kind of a ventilated bottom of this, of the barge box. It works essentially the same way as a regular grain dryer would work, but our product isn't moving in, in modern grain dryers. The product is actually moving. Ours is stationary. So that's the only difference, but it works pretty well. It's not perfect, um, but it's a heck of a lot better than no drying. Right. And then you're monitoring how dry the corn, the, the grain actually gets and then pulling it off at the right time. Yeah, absolutely. And we've learned a lot about, you know, ambient uh, humidity and the effect on the speed of drying and all that kind of thing. The interesting thing with the small grains is that, you know, when you're using a moisture tester, the majority of the testers are, you know, corn, soybeans, hard wheat, soft wheat, oats, and then they don't have settings for felt or einkorn <laughs> or anything like that. So you have to kind of get creative even with that, you know, and, and calibrating the machinery to kind of give us an idea about how dry things are and figuring out how to do that even. Because getting that grain dry, just like curing an onion, is mm-hmm. is going to go a long ways towards determining how well it's going to store. Absolutely, you know, and and with your long term storage for small grains, you want them dry down to like you know eleven percent or so. And you know, like here's a great example: we harvested corn last week. My bloody butcher corn came in from the field at twenty four percent moisture. That is not a nightmare situation, you know, it's not a, a, a 30, but it's really wet. It's very wet at 24% and it will spoil so fast. So you have to be ready because these heirloom corn and things like that, they just, 
they've not been selected for that ability to dry down in the field. No one's done that work on them. Um, so, yeah, we're working on it. But, yeah, the dryer was fired up and loaded up immediately when that corn came in from the field. Do you have to pace your harvest to, to match how quickly you're able to get stuff cleaned and dried? Or are you, is it something you can kind of handle in a batch process? We are this year because typically um, my corn goes in last. You know, my brother, they're doing conventional, so they have seed treatments on their corn, so they can plant in April. Uh, this year, we had intended to plant my stuff right, you know, May 15th, but it rained the entire month of May. And we did not get back into the field to plant my stuff until uh, June 1st. In fact, some of the last of the corn went in on June 4th. So my stuff got a real late start, and then it got hit with a drought, and it was a rough year for it. But um, we typically, um, let's see, normally we're picking my corn in the snow around Thanksgiving. And... This year, you know, we harvested two types of corn last week, and now it's raining, so we're just drying that down, and we're waiting to get back into the field to finish the other three up. And it buys me time to get out there and get my hand harvesting done, because I go out and hand harvest all my seed. Going out and pre-selecting the the ears off of the plants that you want on a yep. given variety for the corn. Yep, okay. yep. And it actually is kind of, you know, if you're doing seed saving, you want that corn to experience some serious weather because you want to you want to check the standability of it. You want it standing up in the field. You don't want it falling down, and you got to let it get good and dry and get some wind to really test the strength of that stalk, you know. And we just made great um, strides with with how the corn looks and how it stands in the field in the last few years because I've been going out and doing the seed saving. I feel like it's the thing that's missing from a lot of of seed preservation efforts is that that level of intention that putting it in and saying we're growing this in this place for this reason and moving the genetics in this direction yeah. while maintaining these other genetics. Yeah. You know? it- it would be really nice, you know, I, there's getting to be more small grains and corn, um, people planting things and saving seeds. And as we get established and we get networked together, which is the next step, is for us to kind of network ourselves together. It'd be fun to trade five pounds of my improved, you know, Reed Yellow Dent with another farmer, maybe from Iowa or Indiana or Ohio or Kentucky just so that we can keep trading our genetics and it will end up making our corn all the better to, to, you know, have those inputs. It's going to make a really good um, genetic line there that is very adaptable to different states in the Midwest. Yeah. Having, having that, I almost think of it as like a buffering capacity in the genetics, Right. you know, and it seems like with some of the things you were talking about, about climate change earlier and how that's influencing what grains even that you can grow in a particular place, having that buffering capacity is going to be really important. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we started a small nursery this year. I um, acquired some, a wide variety of different types of small ancient grains from all over the United States. And we grew out maybe 30 different varieties. Um, all very small amounts, but it's interesting because I can already see there was a real standout type of emerfero that came through that I was just incredibly impressed with, and um, as we go on, it might be resistant to uh, some of the diseases that we struggle with, whether it be scab or um, vomitoxin or you know, that kind of thing. And those are those genetics we need to pull out if we want to want to try to grow this stuff in the Midwest. And it's just, for me, it keeps it interesting. It keeps my mind working. It keeps me engaged in um, farming in a way that I really enjoy because, it, you know, there's always something new to mull over while you're two row cultivating five acres of corn, you know. Right. right. 
All right, Andy. So we're going to take a break here and get a word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back to talk some more about your farm. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by the Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort V and Fort Light potting mixes. What if you didn't have to worry about weak transplants and poor germination due to less than great potting soil, or getting truly finished compost for your homemade blend, or making sure that your employees remember to add the fertilizer charge? Ugh been there, done that. What if you could ch- grow plants up until the roots filled the container without having to worry about supplying extra fertility? What if your potting soil had your back consistently year after year? That's what Vermont Compost Potting Soil can bring to you. Vermont Compost Fall pre buy Program going on now through December 21st can ensure that you enjoy the guaranteed best price, the best shipping options, and receive your soil at a time that works best for you. Plus, their shared truckloads program organizes shipping to other regions in ways that get shipping prices down to the level you'd pay right there in the great state of Vermont. Taking care of growers by taking care of transplants since 1992. VermontCompost.com The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Farmigo CSA Management Software, providing the tools you need to manage your CSA business. Farmigo CSA Management Software is designed from the ground up to manage the CSA you operate from customer sign-up right through delivery. Farmigo staff will work with you to customize the dashboard for your farm based on the way your CSA works. System setup is free, and the system can be configured for a wide variety of CSA models, from the traditional box plan right through fully modifiable boxes. On the customer side, Farmigo offers a portal for members to sign up, make payments, and access their account to manage vacation holds and site changes, all with the control by the farm over what can be changed and when the changes can be made. On the farmer side, you can send fully customizable confirmation emails and auto responses and generate reports to help you manage everything from harvest and loading the truck right through delivering the CSA shares. And they offer amazing customer support to you at no charge. They'll even call you if you need help. Learn more at csamanagementsoftware.com. All right, and welcome back to the show, Andy. So I visited your farm back in 2012 as part of a project that I did with the Angelic Organics Learning Center. And it was right in the middle of of this horrible generational drought. I think I was actually out there in August. And I have to say, of all of the farms that I visited that year, yours was actually, you were doing good. The the crops were there. Um, they looked solid and and you were I mean, you were working hard, but but you weren't you weren't laid out flat yet. Um, I, I just I think it's got to be really interesting in a place like northern Illinois. I mean, you're not exactly in a bastion of liberalism out there to be forging ahead with, I mean, first the vegetables and then the and then the grains as and and also as a woman farmer. Well, you know, some people just have to march to the beat of their own drummer, and I guess I'm just one of those people. When it comes down to it, I just like a challenge, and I have always gravitated toward nature and being outdoors and growing up on a farm. You just, you know, I don't know, maybe it's just the stubbornness or something about it. I don't know, but I... I really like learning. I love growing food for people. I love the connection of it. And I really do believe that it it's making your body, you know, it's what you're made of. And um, everything stems from the soil, everything that we have. And so it's, you know, it's a spiritual connection for me and it's just a real passion. And I find it very healing, you know, in a world where there's so much strife and chaos and, you know, whether it be all the horrendous attacks that just went on um, on the other side of the world and in France, there's something about nature that's just this very, you know, simple, strong, stabilizing force. And I think that that can come through food as well. I actually think it's one of the really cool things about farming and especially about raising food for people is you are what you eat. And I mean, like you said, and kind of taking all of that, I don't know, all the, the I mean, food's more than the sum of its parts and putting all of that together uh, and, and giving that to people is just such a fantastic thing to be able to do. Um, and on a, on a farm for you, that's been around since, I mean, well, basically since settlement, here in the Midwest. I mean, since white people came to the Midwest, this your farm's been there. 
Yeah, well, you know, my family, um, they started farming down in Old County, or my, my grandfather did. Uh, and as they, you know, made some money and bought more land, they kept buying better land. So they moved northward up toward the Seward area in the Winnebago County. And then uh, the farm where I grew up on, I think Grandpa purchased that around 1953. And okay. then, yeah, this place that I'm at, my parents purchased on um, 1977 or 1978. Um, so we've been farming here since 1847 in Northern Illinois. So we've been, you know, we've made it a while. And I think it comes back to the goal with with this type of diversification is to last another 160 years, you know, and give give all the nieces and nephews an opportunity to farm as well. And, and there'll be lots of, hopefully, there'll be lots of different opportunities. It wouldn't just be farming. It might be a marketing position with the farm or you know, some such thing like that. And you farm now actively with your dad or is your operation completely separate? My operation is, um, well, you know, it's family and we farm land together and we share equipment. So um, legally and financially, uh, my operation is separate. Um, But, you know, when we need to replace the one horsepower motor around the clipper, then that's when dad steps in. And so he's still very involved in both operations. Um, my brother has has taken over the main part of the farm, but dad is down at the grain dryer the whole time and, and helping to organize everything and keep everything running. So we, we are interdependent, or I'm probably a little bit more interdependent than they are. They definitely could probably operate without me. Um, but I'm, you know, definitely tied into the family farm, although I'm, you know, a separate entity. What does your brother think of, of his crazy sister? <laughs> he used to think I was pretty crazy, but, you know, He's been watching. He is super savvy. And when they first came out with GPS, which is probably, what, 15 years ago, maybe longer, he was right on it. And he was, you know, arguing with Dad about how important it was to embrace this type of technology. And he's super savvy. And so he's really curious about what I'm doing. And he's been um, really helpful with solving problems. Particularly when it comes to, if we have to design or build a piece of equipment, he and I, before the fire, he and I had been working on our own dehuller, and we came up with this this idea based off of a pottery wheel and um, had it working pretty darn good. And so I'm looking forward this winter to him and I having some time to go back and and rebuild that piece of equipment and head down that road because his his eye for um you know just the design of things and and making and welding is really really good and he's very curious you know to see what happens and and been very supportive of, of what i'm up to you know he i recently applied for a value-added processor grant this past spring and as part of the grant, the family members have to write a letter of support. Um, and it was an interesting, it was interesting to read his letter um, because he led on to some things in the letter that we wouldn't have probably talked about, you know, at at the dinner table or standing around in the shop. And just that he likes the idea of making your own marketplace of not being slave to the seed dealer and then slave to, you know, the big corporations that, you know, the prices are set. That he, he doesn't have a lot of freedom in marketing his crop. So he really likes the idea of, of us being able to create our own, own marketplace. Now, you mentioned earlier that your family isn't an organic farming family. Are you organic? I'm not certified, but I am, uh, 
yeah, we're not, I'm not farming with chemicals, no. And we're not, you know, we're not spraying any Roundup or any fungicides or insecticides, pesticides, any of that. We're just using rotation and selection, and the selection is the big part of it, is out there in that field, checking those ears, looking at them to see, you know, was that chewed on by an earworm or not? And so that's been, been the angle I'm taking. Has that been a, a point of contention with the family at all? No, they do think I'm kind of crazy about saving seed, but they also haven't tried to find, you know, 60 pounds of red corn seed because it's nearly impossible. Um, and then when you do find it, it's genetically kind of a mess. And um, it's taken me a long time to get get my corn looking the way it does. Now, this year, the yellow dent really performed really nice. And we were joking that, that my ears were looking better than my brother's. Um, <laughs> you know, it's fun to go out in the field and harvest it year after year, though, and really start to see your efforts pay off and just how it looks and standability and uniformity. And that's the part that I really, really like that part. So. Well, and I, and I guess I wasn't thinking so much about the seed saving as being a point of contention as I was about the chemical usage or the, or the lack thereof. Yeah. The main thing, you know, Adam and I have been talking a lot about trying to under seed uh, the corn with like a winter wheat or something like that. Now, other people have done this. We really want to experiment with it and see how it works. Um, and I think it's a great idea. Either that or some type of clover. It's just so hard in the spring and summer. You're busy. We're trying to make hay. And on top of growing everything, I'm trying to fill orders and weed the garlic and, and weed the nursery and do this and do that. We all have our lives too. So, you know, these projects that they just take time to make the time to do it and make it a priority. But yeah, we're very curious to look into underfeeding. So that would be one of our things. Dad, Dad likes driving a two row cultivator. The truth is, if I wasn't using all this old equipment, I'm not sure what a big of, if he would be that big of a fan, but it gives him a reason to go to an auction and buy a John Deere A, a you know? <laughs> <laughs> that, which is which is really the best reason to have kids get into farming, right? Is, is exactly. you need to buy more toys. Yeah. Well, and my dad has always loved old equipment, and if he really enjoys fixing it up, and he really enjoys using it, and my operation wouldn't exist if he didn't have that passion. Because you know, I'm really good at certain things. You know, I was really good at growing carrots. I'm really good at growing garlic, and and you know, marketing the stuff and the seeds and the whole thing, but I am not good at fixing up old John Deere. That is not my strength that I bring to the table. So tell us about, about how you're marketing your grains. Uh, you mentioned that that's something that you're doing, of course, as the crop is growing because grains are kind of a year-round thing for eating. It's not like Brussels sprouts. Yeah. Um, so how does that work? It was a real different, um, moving from the vegetables, so everything has to be marketed right as you, you know, harvest it. You have to be on top of it. The grains is a longer term marketing effort because you're marketing year round and you're, we've moved away from farmers markets and CSA to direct sales to restaurants, co-ops, and then, you know, starting to work with distributors. And those relationships take time to build, particularly if you're going to work with a distributor or get yourself into a new grocery store or something like that. So there are accounts that I've been, you know, worked on for maybe five months before we ever made our first sale. In the vegetable business, that wouldn't happen because the tomatoes are long gone by then, you know. Right. But it is about long-term relationships. And for us, we're small, we're still getting established and um, figuring out how to do the processing. And so we have our website where we do our retail sales and that's kind of the portal to contacting us for wholesale. And it works pretty good. I mean, we, I need to get back into Chicago and see my chefs. I miss them and, and they miss me. And 
I'm looking forward to having some face-to-face conversations. And um, other than that, it's been, you know, a lot of the groundwork was laid with that vegetable operation. So it's just a matter of maintaining those relationships. And does it feel to you like that that restaurant market is really the the best place to be right now? Or do you feel like there's grains are coming on as a consumer item? I think that they are coming on as a consumer item. And the thing with grains is because it's a year-round sale with, like, say, a grocer or a distributor, it's just a different relationship. It's a longer term. It's not seasonal. Um, And the other big thing is once you step away from those seasonal crops and get into a crop that is available year-round for them, you need to make sure you actually have enough of it to supply them for the year because there is an inherent expectation that you won't run out of those rolled oats. And so that's been kind of an interesting thing to grapple with. Yeah. How do you, how do you do that supply management? Well, we are at the signs now where we're ready to start um, signing contracts. And that's something I'm really looking forward to um, just to kind of, stabilize the business and clarify expectations and poundage because it can be, when you're operating on a small scale, let's say someone comes in and says, well, we want 100 pounds of rolled oats a week, or let's just say 200 pounds a week. So you go back and you do your math and you figure out your loss and you figure out, you know, okay, when I clean the oats, I lose 5 or 10% and this and that, comes out 7 acres of our own. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so these small weekly clients can suddenly become really big when you start looking at making sure that you have a supply for them for an entire year and even a little longer. It's like you kind of want to make sure you can supply somebody maybe for 15 months because if you get your oats in late or maybe you don't get them harvested on time or something breaks down, you need to buy yourself some extra time there and, and tab that. Um, window of when your next year's crop is going to come on. So it, it's definitely an adjustment in that sense of, of planning that acreage out and making sure that you can supply that person. Yeah, and if you're talking about 30 acres of grains, a $200 a week account ends up being a pretty big deal. Yeah, yeah, it can. It can add up real quick. As far as as far as packaging and and regulations around that, are you what what have you had to do to be able to to be able to mill basically mill product and sell it as food? Well, you know, it was um, once we got into looking into the regulations, we decided that the the milk house at the farm would be the perfect spot for our milling operations, and it's a small room, but. We don't have a huge mill. We're just running like a little eight-inch stone mill. And so between that and our sister, and that's where the packaging goes on, it actually works really well. And the scary part is for for farmers, um, we did have to register with the federal government as a food processing facility. And so, you know, when you fill out that paperwork and you register on the website and then we are inspected um, by an inspector here in Illinois, inspect our facility. And so those are the biggest things. And a lot of that uh, sanitation and checklists and all those types of things, I was already familiar with because of GAP, the Good Agricultural Practices thing with vegetables. So um, it wasn't that big of a shocker. It would be more of a shocker if you were a conventional farmer that wanted to do food grade processing. That would be, it would be a little overwhelming probably at first, but going from vegetables into grain, there was, you know, in some ways less oversight with the grain because you're not washing anything. You're not getting anything wet. Right. And well, not, and I guess there's there's probably a presumption that people are going to cook it before they eat it. There is. It's considered a raw agricultural commodity, so it is a little bit different than vegetables. 
So Andy, tell me about how you're packaging the product then. And and again, you're this is this is packaging for restaurants. You're not actually putting this onto grocery store shelves, are you? Well, you know, it's been interesting. When we started out, we were doing um, uh, retail sales to our CSA members, and that's kind of how we started out. So our original packaging was all retail in paper bags with little windows that were basically kind of like coffee bags, coffee bean bags. Um, And then we quickly realized that was not very sturdy. And that if we wanted to pick up more clients and and be available in a grocery store or someplace like that or um, at a farmer's market, that we needed something a little bit more substantial. So we moved to a clear plastic resealable bag and um, did all of our own packaging in-house and labels and everything like that. In the midst of all that, we were really pushing the wholesale, the bulk with the restaurants. And so we started packaging in 25 pound bags and we continue to package the majority of our product in 25 pound bags to do our bulk sales. And then um, we pulled back some from retail packs because we stopped doing farmers markets. It just made sense for us for the size of the operation and the amount of money that we were making at market. We do a little bit of retail still in the Chicago area, but it's definitely not a focus. And you mentioned money. I mean, at at 30 acres of grains, are you are you making a living on that, or is this something that's that's still a a, a very much a growing startup enterprise? This is still a growing startup enterprise. We are getting to the point now where we've made enough. Um, uh, infrastructure, you know, we were getting the infrastructure basically all together. We just need to put, put the finishing touches on some things and it's looking it's looking much better now. Um, you know, they say a small business, give it five years. And even though I was moving from vegetables into grain, there were so many equipment. It was all equipment and then just figuring things out. And we've had some stops and starts with distributors as well. And that was um, some real learning experiences of of just realizing when you get to a certain size, you need a contract so that everybody's clear. I think the thing that's hard when you start working with distributors, if they aren't really vested in you, if you don't really have a strong relationship, you can, you're planning a year or two ahead for your harvest, you know, so like everything we planted back in April is for sale in 2016. And it's going to be for sale until like this time in 2016. Yeah, and even into 2017 because you want to build into that buffer. So you're operating, you're trying to plan almost two years in advance when you're you're working with these like seed grade commodities. And that gets really tricky when you have a distributor that might be painting a picture for you of, oh, the growth is going to be so great. Everything is going to be roses. We're going to do, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of business with you. And then when it comes down to it, their plans change. And you might not be a part of their future plans. And they don't always tell you straight up, you know, they're not obligated uh, to you in any way. And that's where that contract comes in. Um, Because I think it's hard with the local food movement and with the organic movement. When you're a family farmer, you kind of have an expectation of if somebody says something, that their word is good forever or until they tell you otherwise. And and that's where the rubber hits the road is because that's not always the case. You know, people are in this business for money and to capitalize on the movement. And I think it's good to be aware of that. And that's where that contract comes into play. You can't, it, it's probably not going to save you, but it definitely makes all the parties at the table really think about what they're signing on to. You're selling through the distributors as well as going direct through the restaurants. Yes. Yes. We don't, um, you know, a no compete clause or anything like that would not be anything we would ever sign because you just don't know what's going to happen in the marketplace. 
everything's too volatile right now. So, you know, when we sign on with a distributor, it's in a spirit of we're going to work together and there's going to be transparency. And it's easier for me to work with a distributor. But if they drop me, what happens to me? What happens to all my restaurants that I just handed over to them? Those are the things that, as a farmer, you need to be wary of when you get into to these agreements. So what are some of the advantages that you found of working with a distributor? Because that's something that a, a lot of people are being pressured to do now. You know, we're trying, everybody's it's all about scaling up and, you know, selling to the food hub and, and which is really just another kind of distributor. Right. Um, what, I mean, but you're taking a lower price. So, I mean, you must, you must have found some real value in that. Well, for us, it's easier because you can put, you know, 500 pounds of oats on a pallet, send it in there, and you're done. You don't have to ship those out, you know, 25 and 50 pounds at a time. On the other hand, if they find a different person to supply them and they like their price better, you're gone. You know, it's it's going to be that same thing. And we all used to hear about what would happen with people that would sign on with Whole Foods or uh, Walmart to be a supplier and how they would be pushed into those lower price brackets. They would almost be forced. We're going to yep. start seeing that happen in the organic local food market. We already are seeing it. Um, and private label type stuff and all these sorts of things are sneaking in already. And it's just, you know, you just need to know that you have to be in control of your sales. And you don't ever want to put all your eggs in one basket. It's that old adage that we always come back to. So I think it's just one of those things you got to keep in mind as you're growing to do it carefully and thoughtfully. So Andy, I'm I'm actually coming off of a whole string of interviews with guys, and I, I did a I did a really good job uh, early on in the in the podcast of trying to have some gender balance, and and then we just we sort of tipped into into male land for a while here, and um and so it, as as we're sort of swerving back towards towards trying to get some balance again, I'm kind of curious what what have you found to be true about being a woman farmer in a male dominated environment. Well, you know, in your defense, it would be easy to slip into guy land because there aren't a lot of women farmers out there. Um, just naturally, it's not, it's, it's a very physical, demanding profession. And, you know, in rural areas, women, it's just, you know, you have a husband and there's kids and uh, there's other things to do, and women tend to, on farms, tend to be more in charge of the bookkeeping and the, um, at least in my home growing up, my mom was the, she was the accountant, and she was the lawyer. She was the law mind, and she took care of all that stuff, and dad did all the physical labor. So it is, you know, it is, I think the biggest thing for me about being a female farmer is just the machinery. It drives me crazy. We've got a, a New Holland, nothing against the New Holland, but the dang thing, the skid steer turns off on me because I'm not tall enough or heavy enough to override the safety settings on it. <laughs> and and you at me, I'm not a very big lady. And yeah. that thing just drives me insane because it's dangerous. I mean, I'll be there and I'll have a 2,000 pound tote lifted up in the air and I need to adjust the times and I move on the seat just enough forward that the thing will turn off on me. And I think those are the things that absolutely drive me crazy. And every time I get the chance to complain about it, I do because it is dangerous. That's kind of crazy. I mean, you, it's the, it's the sort of thing I would expect to find on older equipment. I mean, I remember I had a hard time operating the clutch on our old farm all 504, mm -hmm. um, that we had on my farm, but the, the, I wouldn't expect that to be the case on more modern equipment. Uh, it, you know, if, if the seat would move forward, it probably wouldn't be, but it only has, it has like a weight adjustment to go from 300 pounds to, to a hundred pounds. And it's just not, if I was six inches taller, 
it'd probably be fine. But when I need to move the pedals, my back isn't against the seat. And because I got to be closer. <laughs> and so yeah. it just doesn't, it doesn't work for me. Um, but other than that, you know, with farming, I grew up around my dad and he always was leaning toward older farmers because he always liked antique equipment. And so my entire childhood was spent around old men. <laughs> and I think in some ways, I didn't really notice I was a girl. You know, it just came naturally to me. And my grandfather would take us out in the fields and show us how to tell when the hay was ready to be baled. And he really instilled, you know, a love of fruit trees in me and horses and chickens. And um, it just it was always like breathing. You know, being outside the farm, it was just always like breathing for me. So you have you found social challenges there in in your in your rural environment? Um, only because my father will never hear this uh, because he doesn't really use the internet. I would say the biggest thing in in the farming, just the family farm business, is that he and I come to a head sometimes. And I don't know if it's because I'm a woman or because I'm his daughter or because I'm his child or because I just, we're both really stubborn and we're too much alike. Um, but those, I would say in, in the farming realm, my most challenging relationship is with my father. And that is just, I think my brother would probably say the same thing. <laughs> you know, so I think it's just a family thing. I am kind of curious, though, to ask you, since you, you're coming off a string of um, interviews with men, do you think that men and women approach farming differently? You know, I'm I'm always really cautious about painting with a broad brush, um, but I I do think they do. Um, I feel like, you know, and again, I mean. Here, here I go, right? This is the white guy talking about how it is for women to be in the world. But I feel like guys tend to bull through things more. Um, I feel like women tend to tend to figure things out. You know, it, it you know, I mean, my my partner's a, a small woman. She's your size. I mean, there, there's not you. You just you can't brute force your way around a hay bale. Yeah. Um, it just doesn't work. Uh, I can, I'm six foot tall. Um, and, and it's pretty, th that stuff's made for me, yeah. you know? And, and so I think, I think there's just a way in which I think women, women tend to, to maybe farm just a little bit smarter. Um, in my experience too, women tend to gravitate towards a smaller operation, but I'm not, again, I'm not sure if that's, if that's a nature of the beast because of, of operating equipment and backgrounds, or if that's a, you know, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know whether it's, whether that's, that's society or whether that's biology or. Right. Um, that part's probably a little bit of both. You know, it is interesting. I think a lot of it does have to do. I think as women in the world, we don't have that brute force. And I just watched my my hired uh, man that helps me in my mill, Randy. He is amazing. And and the one, I watch him pick something up 70 pounds and lift it chest tight. And I'm like, geez, I wish I could do that. Um, but that's why I have him there. And that's why he has the position that he has at my farm is because some of that physical stuff I can't do anymore or never could. Um, but the one thing that is been interesting of being a woman boss and having, uh, you know, men working under me is that I've taught him about intuition because, yeah. you know, sometimes I'll be like, you know, Randy, when you shifted that, did it seem different to you or odd? And he'll say, yeah, yeah, it did. It didn't feel right. And I said, don't package it up then. <laughs> you know, follow through with that intuition. Set it aside with a note that says, look at this. I don't like it. Or it's odd or different. And his intuition is there. And I think especially in farming where there's a lot of danger, 
involved, I think it's incredibly important to, to cultivate that intuition of, you know, if I do that, that 500 pound thing could fall on my head. <laughs> right. You know? Right. And so I think that's one of the more interesting things that in the vegetable farm, I had more women working for me. And with the grain farm, I have more men working for me. And me making the transition as a boss, I'm more gruff, I find, with the men than I am with the girls. And then, you know, with the women, the intuition thing always came naturally. And with the men, it's something that has to be taught more. And so I think that's been kind of an interesting transition as a boss. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing that I've that I've heard from a lot of women and that, and I experienced uh, when I was farming with my um, when I was farming previously is I think it can be sometimes hard to be taken seriously as a woman in farming. I mean, it was hard to be taken seriously as a vegetable grower in in a sea of corn and soybeans. And it was hard to be taken as, as seriously, especially as an organic vegetable grower in a sea of cor- conventional corn and beans. But but I think then you layer on that that being a woman or being some other form of outsider, and you're just it's just your what that one more step removed to where when you walk into the tractor dealership, it's not necessarily like people assume that you know what you're talking about. Right. You know, a long time ago. I decided to not, probably in college sometime, I just stopped caring what people thought. And I just decided that I would approach everything in life with an openness and a smile. And that really changed things for me because I just stopped judging myself and I stopped judging others. And sometimes I think when we... Well, I live in, I mean, I am surrounded by a sea of of conventional farmers, but a lot of those conventional farmers are trying to diversify in their own way. So it might be as simple as I'm going to try a non-GMO soybean this year alongside my regular GMO soybean, or I'm going to experiment with no-till. I think that when you're a farmer, there's a constant evolution and you constantly are pushing the boundaries of your land, your talent, the crop. Um, You're constantly learning and experimenting. And across the board, any good farmer does that. And, And anyone who doesn't isn't farming anymore because it's too rough out there. This is not an easy industry. It doesn't matter what you grow. Um, to stay in. And so I, I like to try to draw on the things we have in common um, rather than the things we don't. Um, I think as a woman, here, up here we have a pretty good network. As you said, you had worked through, we met through the Angelic Organic Learning Center. So it's very easy, even though I'm an organic farmer, to live in a protected bubble of only being around or only interacting with other organic farmers because we do have a good network up here. And um, I don't interact with conventional people that much other than my family. So I would say, back to the dad comment, I think he might be the one that hits my hardest (laughs) win. You know, it's like the neighbor's great. He's over here going, what are you up to? You know, how'd that work for you this year? Um, but it, it comes back to, you know, family being your harshest critic, I think. Um, I was joking earlier today on the phone, um, we had write up in the Chicago Reader and in the Sun-Times and all these, like, big Chicago publications. One of the most recent was in Edible Chicago, which for me was a really big deal to get a mention. And, um... Recently, uh, I made the cover of like the Illinois um, Farmer Today, I think is what it was. And for dad, that was the big one. You know, it's all about perspective, I guess. It's kind of all about who who's your people. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and where does that come from? Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for taking that detour there. With that, Andrea, and as we're, as we're closing in on our time here, I'd like to switch over to our lightning round. All right. Um, 
Okay. So what's your favorite tool on the farm? Right now, my favorite tool is the gravity table that I haven't been able to use because it's not hooked up yet. Okay. <laughs> it's your, it's your going to be favorite tool really it's soon. It's going to be the, it is the baby. Yeah. We just need to figure out the three phase converter issue. Ooh. You're, you've been learning about a whole new bunch of things to grow here. What's your favorite resource for, for getting new information? Oh, that's kind of hard. You know, my biggest thing is I have a couple of people in the industry now, um, out west because that's one of the majority of small grains where I got hooked in with some support um, through North Dakota State University. And so at this point, there really isn't a book that I can go to. It's more people. It's just talking with other farmers that are growing these types of things and our conversations amongst us. Uh, and that's where I'm learning the most, I would say. That and just in my own little experiments in the fields, whether it be saving seed or starting the nursery, so on and so forth. What do you want for your farm for Christmas? Ooh, what do I want for the farm for Christmas? I think the next thing I want to purchase is a bean polisher. A bean polisher? Yeah, a bean polisher. And I don't know how they work. I've never seen one. I just know they exist. And when I look at my beans, I want them polished. I want a bean <laughs> polisher. That's, that's my next thing I want. <laughs> And if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Marry well. Marry well. <laughs> Wouldn't it be so much more fun if we had reassuring bank accounts? Yeah. <laughs> but but where where would be the challenge in that? I know, I know. I always told the the girls that worked here, I had a lot of young women that would come here and you know, I think as a young woman in this day and age, you kind of have those two roads. Do I go get a master's degree or do I get married and have some kids? And women are a little torn. And, you know, I was like, go your own road, go your own road. And then one night we were out with friends and a dear old friend of mine said, how are you doing? You know, how's the farm going? And I, I looked at him and I said, I should have gotten married. And he started laughing, and one of the girls that worked for me was sitting next to me, and she said, that's not what you told me last week. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's definitely, I don't regret any of my decisions, so there's that. Andrea, thank you so much for being on the Farmer to Farmer podcast tonight. It has just been an absolute pleasure and so wonderful to reconnect with you. Thank you so much. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 41 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast, and that you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for hazard. That's H-A-Z-Z-A-R-D. That's two Z's in hazard. I'm excited to announce a series of workshops that I'm doing this fall on employee management. Employees make it possible to get more done, but managing workers and their work takes dedicated time, energy, and processes. I'll be presenting full-day workshops on managing and motivating employees on the farm in Cedar Rapids, Iowa on Monday, November 30th, and in Columbus, Missouri on Tuesday, December 8th. For more information, including schedules and registration information, visit purplepitchfork.com slash betterboss. If you enjoy the podcast, I think you would also enjoy my weekly email newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga. The Flying Rutabaga runs the gamut from practical templates for delegation to guidelines for watering transplants. You can sign up at farmer farmerpodcastcom or purplepitchfork.com. Also, if you enjoyed the show, it would be great if you would pop on over to iTunes and leave us a review or make a comment on the show notes or tell your friends on Facebook. These reviews and referrals are the bread and butter of making this show available to an ever wider group of listeners. And you know what else? I'd love to hear your suggestions for the show. I know a lot of things, but I don't know all of the great farmers out there. Please visit farmer to farmer podcast.com and use the contact form to tell me who you'd like to hear. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.